Okay, you win. You wanted VGA for the ESP32 S3? You will get it. And it's going to be awesome. This video is sponsored by Eisler. A few years ago, I made a VGA library and a few VGA boards for the ESP32. Many people loved it, but I'm not a manufacturer and I sold only a limited count. Many things changed since then. The ESP32 API was updated a few times and since the ESP32 S3 came out, many people asked me to make a new version of the board since it wasn't compatible with my library anymore. I decided it's time to give you what you want. And this is how the ESP32 S3 VGA was born. Let me take you on the journey how I try to squeeze out the maximum performance of the S3 capabilities and how I'll fight back its flaws. <sighs> When I decided to make the new board a few weeks ago, I wanted to make it more accessible. The boards before required assembly and an extra dev board. Meanwhile I got enough practice to design one that has everything included. It should be just plug and play without much soldering. One requirement I wanted is that it's breadboard friendly. So if you solder on the headers, you can put it on a breadboard and have extra two rows to access the pins. The VGA connector is quite big and the antenna needs some clearance so this shape seems reasonable. The core of all my VGA boards were the resistor letters which convert the digital signals to analog RGB values. I like to have it emphasized in the design. So here are the regions where the color components are converted. I ordered the boards from Eisla and when they arrived I was really excited. Gorgeous. Unfortunately I assumed the VGA connectors I have here were compatible with the footprint from KiCad. The pins wouldn't match. Oh well, it's the first version. But then I remembered I got a few different connectors which are more narrow. These would barely fit with the pins but the board would overhang. Since there were no tracks in this area I decided to simply mill off a few millimeters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Problem solved. Nice. A few moments later. Now that it's assembled, I'm ready for some code. Until this point, I didn't really take a look at the technical reference manual. And once I did, I realized why my old library wasn't working for the S3. Espressive decided to remove the parallel I2S mode and make a new peripheral for cameras and LCDs. It seems that the LCD peripheral can do up to 80MHz 8-bit and 40MHz 16-bit, which is twice as fast as the ESP32 was able to do with I2S. That could unlock 640x480 in 16-bit for us, or maybe even 800x600. But on top of that, the RGB mode has extra signals for H-Sync and V-Sync. This is amazing! As a small recap, these two signals indicate a new frame and a new line on the screen. They are crucial and we had to sacrifice two of the precious bits of the frame buffer for that before. So we were only able to implement 14-bit and 6-bit color video modes. The generated signals also free up some of the system bus during the blank phases where no pixels are displayed. And it also simplifies the implementation overall. At least so I thought. But more on that later. My design was considering only 14-bit and would need an extra bit for green and blue to get the full potential. But for now I could just start testing and just assigning some unused pins to the least significant bits of these color components. The LCD peripheral has a generic driver that I could test. I modified the example a bit and it actually worked. Yes! Unfortunately I found the first blunder in the new peripheral. It didn't support APLL anymore. That's the audio clock that we are using to generate any arbitrary pixel clock. Each VGA mode uses a specific clock and the APLL was able to generate a clean one without any jitter. Now we can pick 240MHz and divide it up. Only a clean fraction will give us jitter-free pixels. TFT screens which use the pixel clock to receive the data don't care about jitter, but our analog video unfortunately is. 
then it would be the target clock. But you know what? It's analog. It might not matter if the clock is a little bit too fast or too slow, as long as it's jitter free. It will just not be perfect 60 Hz. And this is the closest fraction of the clock. And it turns out that most of the screens are actually quite tolerant. Testing that I also noticed that it even seems to support PS RAM. That means that the frame buffer can be completely in external RAM. With the SP32 that was also an option, but the PS RAM was too slow. Therefore we are always limited in color fidelity and resolution. A frame of 640x480 in 8-bit would barely fit in SRAM before. And now we could do that in 16-bit and try going even higher resolutions. I had to test that and desoldered the module and replaced it with one with 2 MB of PS RAM that I had in my lab. It actually worked. Nice. However, a bitter fact is that the 2 MB PS RAM version only supports Quad SPI. That's an SPI interface with 4 data lines to the memory. It's fast but not fast enough for higher resolutions. Nothing. This is where I found out that the modules from 8 MB upwards support Octal SPI which is twice as fast. Unfortunately the 8 MB versions are rare locally. I ordered some from AliExpress, but that would take 10 days to arrive. So I also ordered a dev board with such a module locally that I could sacrifice. When the dev board arrived I did the heart transplant and was ready to test. And it worked! Oh yes! <laughs> Not only 640x480, but also 800x600. <laughs> that was amazing. It was way better than I expected. But there is one thing I learned from the past. Testing on different devices. Uh -oh. And that's where I noticed sync issues. What is that? Unfortunately, three of my other screens seem to adjust the sync at the start of each frame. Okay, that's not good. That was a showstopper. I thought it was the alignment of the V and H sync signals. But it turned out, once I zoomed in on the scope, there was a slight delay at each start of the frame. I took a look in the espresso driver of the LCD peripheral. And hidden underneath of several convoluted abstraction layers, it became clear that each frame is sent individually and the transmission is just restarted after the frame is done. There is no way to control the timing properly. Again, an LCD wouldn't care, but my analog screen, which desperately tries to work with my signal, does. Unfortunately, the lower abstraction layers aren't exposed in the API. So that meant that I had to steal as much code as possible. I'm gonna go build my own driver with blackjack and circular buffers. That also meant I had to take a dive in the technical reference manual again. Oh well. Hacker mode activated. I started with a simpler mode which wouldn't generate the sync signals. It has a few problems to start, but once it runs, it's able to pump some bits. The sync signals were once again in the frame buffer, but I was able to finally get a clean continuous signal. It was finally some success that I was able to share on the live stream. Look at this goodness! Ah, oh, come on! This is awesome! Ah, oh, I love it! And you know what? We were even able to squeeze out 1280 by 720p in 8 bit. What? <laughs> no way! What? This is 720p VGA. This is not noise. This, these are like super small squares. Yes! That works! <laughs> it's shippable already. It's shippable. Love it! Okay. This is amazing and overshadows anything we were able to do before. Even added my old ESP32 ray tracer for the test image. That wasn't enough though. I didn't want to clock the precious bus bandwidth with manual blank signals and wanted my full 8 and 16 bits. It took me a day, but it finally works. Oh, nice. It starts cleanly and we get up to 800 by 600 in 16 bits and 1024 by 768 in 8 bits. Unfortunately, at higher resolutions, there seem to be issues with the peripheral that I couldn't identify yet. 720p should work, but the frame buffer is shifting each frame. That might need some manual hack, but not today. Additionally, some resolutions like 1080p are out of reach. 
someone decided to give the total vertical lines attribute only 10 bits. That limits to 1024 lines, including the blank face and sync. Why? Also, the H sync is only limited to 7 bits, while a few modes would require more. Oh well, we have to work with what we got. I'm happy about the 800 by 600 in 16 bits, and I was even able to hack an out of spec 1024 by 768 in 16 bit, at least on the analog screen. Ah, what a fake mode! This is so cool! That is proof enough that the S3 VGA will work. This is a 16-bit image, but a 14-bit hardware, so we still see some banding here. It should be reduced with uh, full 16 bits. I added the additional bits and reorganized it a bit. This time I want to use Isla's plugin to upload the project directly from here. That has the advantage that I get the revisions automatically organized. And even if I spot an error after ordering the boards, I can still push a new version before the production started. Which actually happens more often than you think. Another feature that helps hiding rough edges from mouse bytes when not using panels are the manual bridges. You just need to indicate the bridges using a 2.2mm line on the edge cut layer. If everything is alright, you will get the note. Last checks with the online viewer and we are ready for the new revision. When ordering boards from Isla, a project is created automatically. I just created a new folder named VGA here and moved the project there to have everything organized. Check out Isla for good and affordable PCBs from Europe. They constantly work on new helpful tools. With the coupon code BOARDLOONY you get 5 euros off your purchase. You will find more information in the description. And now I'm curious about the boards. These arrived within one week. Awesome. The guides worked flawlessly. Even my new connector footprint works. Yes. To assemble the board I'm using the new assembly guide from Isla. It's quite useful to populate the boards quickly. When the project is loaded, I assign the parts that were not found automatically. Then I switch to assembly and get a preview of the parts and their locations. Starting the guide, it will show me where to place the parts grouped by type. This is really handy as I don't have to check my PCB design on the PC to find all the locations for each part type. Since it's working with the browser, I can use it from my tablet at the bench. It's a novelty, but it seems the second revision works flawlessly. The full 16 bits increase the color fidelity significantly. Here is a direct comparison. The color bending is way less noticeable now. 
As a final spice, I added a randomized dithering. Now the color bending is completely gone. This slight noise looks really organic. I love it. I hope you enjoyed these insights in the product development. If you are curious for more, please subscribe and consider supporting me on Patreon, PayPal or with a membership. Thanks for Isla for sponsoring me and big thanks to all my supporters. Your help makes a big difference. I return to some more coding now and I see you next time. Bye! Yeah, ship it and uh, claim on YouTube that it's, it's working. This is so cool. I like it. I really love it.